Just got done clearing the driveway. It's cold and windy outside. The snow on the ground makes it hard for vehicles to gain traction. So rest assured, if vehicles can't have traction, people have a hard time getting traction. But what about rides? Do they have a hard time with traction too? Today I want to talk about proximity sensors. Let's get into it. Now get ready, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ryan Ride Mechanic channel. How the heck are you guys doing today? Thank you for coming back and watching another video. What was up with that intro, right? Did I make it to the wrong video? Oh well, I thought it was good. Nah, just messing with you guys. Thought it was funny. <laughs> Today's program, we're going to be talking about sensors. And in particular, I've got some examples of... Let's see, I've got two proximity sensors and a set of photo eyes that we're going to be playing with. Let's get right into it here. For today's example, I'm going to be using two proximity sensors, both of these guys right there. The first one is a square proximity sensor. It's got like a, I think it only has like a three millimeter sensing range on the front of this thing. Uh, 24 volts, PNP style. And then here is another, this is a barrel or pin proximity sensor. This is also 24 volts, PNP style. And I got both in a nice four wire connection, which is one normally open and one normally close. So these are the best things I prefer about these type of sensors. You can use three wires. You can even use, there's proximity sensors that work off of two wires. But for ease of wiring and solid power connection and everything else, I like to use a four-wire connection. So I got these guys off of Amazon. <laughs> they were dirt cheap, under 10 bucks a piece. Really not bad, considering when you're looking at something with like a 40 millimeter sensing distance, it's like $300 off the internet as well. Unless you go to a sketchy site and buy it, then they're probably a lot cheaper, but don't know what you're going to get with that. So let's talk about proximity sensors real quick. What are they? These are used to determine when something is in front of it but without touching it. For example, limit switches. There's a limit switch. Little tiny, tiny, tiny guy right there. This is a considered a micro limit switch. But the only way it works is that something has to physically come and touch it for it to turn on. So it's got a little roller on top and something has to get right on top of it and touch it. So one of the problems with that is that kind of like no matter what you do, when you make contact with a train, it's not typically a good thing because the train can move from side to side and then if your switch has to touch the train on this side, well what happens if the train goes over to this side? and vice versa. If it's on this side, what happens if it goes over this side? They won't make. And, same problem, if it's on this side and it goes too far to that side, you've just broken the sensor off of the track. Not good, ride goes down either way. We use sensors that don't have to touch anything. With something that just gets near it, something gets within proximity of the switch, it will turn on so we use proximity switches. Amazing. Rule of thumb on these guys is the larger the head is, the further out it can sense. And then same with these guys. You typically use these, the, uh, this is not an exact formula, and I did not get this off the websites or anything like that. Just my own knowledge. Um, your sensing distance away from this head on these guys is on average one-third the diameter. So the diameter of this guy is only about 10 millimeters. So it's got roughly a three millimeter assisting, sensing distance in front of it. That means if it goes more than three millimeters away, it won't pick it up. If it goes closer to it, it's fine. These things will typically pick up right next to them. Um, they are both 24 volts. Most of these things have a range. Like for these, let's see typically right on it. Yeah, this one's 10 to 30, and I believe this other one's also 10 to 30. Yeah, 10 to 30 volts DC. Um, some of the higher dollar ones, they will take almost any voltage you put into them outside of like really high voltage. 
and they will still work because they have some of the, the weight and cost that you're paying for is little tiny transformers on the inside to figure out its own voltage and use it. Um, instances where these guys would be used. Now this isn't a really cool one. I would love to say like I had one from a ride, but I don't. So the ones from a ride, they have a much larger body. So the industrial ones, you could split them where the bottom half can stay into the track and structure and you just change off the sensing head. Also on those, this sensing head is also typically what they do is they make them, they're called five ways because they can mount, like on this one, the way this is mounted, try to show you this here. The sensing head can only mount, or it can only be mounted to where this is the only sensing head right here. This is it. So the, the thing has to come like this. If you want it to read on the side coming in front, then you have to mount it like this to where it can see the front. Or like this to see the side, or like this to see the side. The more expensive proximity sensors, they'll sit like this and then you could just take off the square head and rotate it and put it back on. Uh, they just, you know, they got wires coming down the center. So you just take the head off and move it to any one of the five. One, two, three, four, five. Um, any one of those guys, and it will pick up whichever direction you're going to, which allows for much more flexibility when you're mounting. Um, so these would be used to read anything, really. You could read a chain dog passing by, a wheel carrier passing by. Most of the time, rides use either, like if it's a B&M, they use the belly of the train, the flat spot underneath the train as it comes over. Or most uh, older, or I should say older, other styles use the brake fin, the brake fin, which is a large piece of metal, and they go by. I had the question recently, kind of recently, um, where I was talking about the flag for Top Thrills, that lawsuit, um, they said, I said, well, they have sensors that the flag plate is supposed to trip. And they said, hey, what's a flag plate? That was a good question. So you have these guys, which can read the belly of the train, but every time the train passes over, there's a gap where the hitch is. So it actually reads multiples as it passes by. Same thing with the brake fin. There's a gap where the brake fin passes by multiples as it goes by. So sometimes you don't want to know that, but you want an exact position as it passes over. So what they do is typically one on the front, one on the back, on average, but not all the time, you mount a flag plate. And the plate, it says, okay, all those other sensors can count wheel carriers, they can count the belly, they can count chain dogs, whatever it is. But when that plate gets over that proximity sensor, it's typically a stop command saying that the train's in spot where it's going to be, it doesn't need to go any further. So they typically use flagging plates for homing the train in a particular track section. I know some B&Ms use a series of flagging plates. There's one on the left-hand left side front wheel carrier that was used to home the train. And the way they did that is they used two proximity sensors like this with a flag plate that came right over the center like this. So when it would approach the first one, it would slow down. And then when it get over the second one, it would stop. And as long as both sensors were made, the train was pretty reliable. It was within about a six millimeter homing space. And then that would allow other things to happen. Um, and then in conjunction with that front flag, they would then put one on the same wheel carrier on the other side, different size though, and then sometimes same uh, the left side one row back. And they would use these sensors off to the sides to then count the number of flags on the train, and that way the ride knew which train it was. Pretty cool, right? So if there was one flag on the load side wheel carrier only, that was train one. One flag load side carrier, one load unload side carrier, one, that was train two. Load side, unload side, and load side carrier two, or row two, that was train number three. So it was way of counting, and that helped for tracking cycles and stuff like that. Um, when you have a train passing by these guys, there is a fine line between flagged and not flagged. 
So if you get if you had a train going by and you're let's say counting wheel carriers on the side, and as the wheels pass by or the carriers pass by because they're steel, it goes one, two, three, four, but then it turns out number four was just a hair too far away for some reason, won't count four. But the right side would count. So you'll get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, pass that guy. And the other side will go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, pass that guy. When it goes to reset that block, it says, what were my counts? And the sensor on this side says, I got eight. That channel was good to reset. This side says, I got seven. No good. So it shuts the ride down because it says either this sensor encountered a fault along the way and it's not working anymore by fault they just mean like the sensor broke so either this sensor broke or it's safe to assume that part some of or maybe even all of the train has not cleared that segment yet so out of safety they shut the ride down nothing is going to happen until those counts become happy now if it keeps doing it we would look for patterns we go out there and we say um, okay, well, it did this miscount in the block. It's like, all right, which train was running? It was train two. Where was number one? Number one's in the station. Okay. We reset it, run some cycles. If it didn't immediately do it for us again, within like three cycles, we'd open the ride back up. And then later on in the day, it would fault again, the exact same fault. And then we go out there and we'd say, which train is it? Well, number two was running. Number one was in the station. Think there might be a problem with train number two for some reason i don't know why but there might be so we might sideline train number two take it off and we're inspecting it and we're looking at all the wheel carriers we're checking spacers we're checking bushings to see if there's any abnormal wear or play anything while we're doing that the ride goes down again same fault aha now it's not train number two the first two times it was just a coincidence was not a pattern. So now it's train number one doing it. So now it's safe to say we're gonna go up to that section wherever it might be and we're gonna find that sensor that's calling out as faulty and we're gonna replace it. Now, this is not the reason. Now, keep in mind, this is three downtime calls now. And now this is a pretty clear cut case. Most of the time they'll get up to like five or six downtime calls before there's enough consistency to actually pinpoint it. But sometimes, it's not actually that sensor. Sometimes it was one in front of it or one behind it, depending on how the ride's faults work. So that was one of the unusual things we had to deal with. It was like, okay, well, we would take that sensor out and replace it with a new one. There you go, new sensor, bring the ride up and running. Hey, what was that wrong with that ride? Oh, well, we spent a while troubleshooting it, but we finally figured out it was that one sensor midway down the block. Okay, yeah, but we replaced it. We won't have troubles with it again. Ride goes down. Same exact fault. Now what do you do? Well, now I'm thinking, like, is it the wiring running to the sensor? Because remember, on the industrial ones, this whole assembly isn't replaced, just the top half. And they have pins that stick into the back. So I'm like, is there a wiring problem? Is there corrosion on the inside? So we might go through and then replace the base next. If it does it again, then we might like I pull brand new wire into that base. And you know, it's like I rewired everything from the junction box up to that sensor. So it's gotta be it. Then it does it again. And that's when we start doing what's called shotgun troubleshooting, right? Well, we've now had like 10 ride calls for this thing. The ride's been up and down over the past two days. We're still trying to figure it out, but we don't know what's wrong with it because it still says it's this prox, but we don't know why. So we're out there. We're like starting to replace all the proxes in that section. We don't know why, but we're looking for anything. We pulled apart. Is there corrosion on the inside? Is there rust? Is there condensate? Like what is happening? Why is this thing keep figuring it, faulting out? And then eventually we might just replace the prox and then the problem just goes away. Why? I don't know. I don't know. What was the last thing we did? We replaced these two proxes and that two proxes at the front caused the fault in the middle of the block to go away. It did. I don't know why, but it did. So these are, these are some of the things why rides get an extensive amount of downtime around 
sensor faults because they're not always just very clear like hey it's that sensor go replace it just because you have a lot of logic built into a ride doesn't necessarily mean it will tell you what's wrong there's still a lot of deductive reasoning that goes on um, moving away from proximity sensors for a second uh, this this is the other one anyone know what these guys are these are photo eyes right here I have one receiver and one sender if you look at it this one has a I don't know if you can see that this one has an IR with an arrow pointing away from the rectangle that means this one's the sender and this one right here got tape over it sorry about that but it has an IR with a rectangle and it has an arrow pointing to it which means the signals coming from this guy and it's being received in this guy so these are what you stretch across rides block segments brake zones whatever in fact these two are from a ride <laughs> because the lenses were compromised the seals broken and what would happen in the morning time especially when the weather swung really hard is that they would condensate on the inside and it would cause them not to receive the signal so they would read actually the ride block was occupied so we replaced them it's like well they do no good on rides anymore so this was one of the things I wanted to save so I asked the boss hey can I take the trash home boss said yes you could take the trash home here's my trash right here so let's turn these guys on and play with them it'll be fun okay we're gonna do a little bit of experimenting here I think most of you recognize this if you watch my videos from last time here's my infamous red bulb that indicates that the signal has gone through and here's my photo eyes here I've taken a little bit of time out of this video to pre-wire them uh, these work off 115 volts so hopefully this time it doesn't mess up my microphone but we'll see and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take this guy and plug them in all right now these two guys are communicating with each other and they're shooting a beam from one side to the other this guy is receiving it so it's actually taking the signal and turning the bulb on if I break the beam now it turns the bulb off now these things are really powerful they're honestly meant to shoot across about I don't know 50 no longer than that they're they're meant to go across about a hundred feet so they're extremely powerful so my hand might not block it all the way each time but there we go so they're blocked right now so this is what I'm using is I'm using the normally open function saying that when they have communication they close so the sensor is like okay I could see the other side that means I'm turning on I'm closing which turns on the light bulb now I'm going to stop it for a second and we're going to switch that function to the normally closed side of the photo eye all right we'll take this guy plug him back in you see my light did not turn on because right now they have communication back and forth I don't know if you could see the light maybe I could use my secondary camera again if you could see the light on this side it's got a green light stating that it's on and on this side has a green and an orange light stating that it has signal so if we go back and look at the two and I break them my bulb is now on so this is the normally closed side of the circuit now this is actually what I would use in the case of like if you were just looking for somebody like hey I'm just I want to count people 
that's fine. I would use a normally closed side to count. No big deal. Why would I not use this side to go on a ride? It's like, hmm. Why would I not use this to put on a ride? Well, I wouldn't use this on a ride because this state right here is the exact same as this state right here. There's no change. So I put it together like that and I say, are the photo eyes working? I go, yes. Prove it. It's like, well, they, they have power. Yeah, but are they seeing each other? Oh, uh, I don't know. They have power. The only way to do it would be to go out and flag it. It's like, okay, well, what happens if the train's coming up and then right as the train comes up, it goes, well, it didn't see it because it lost power. But if we change this and we go back to the other side, can the photo eyes see each other? Yes. How do you know? It's turning on the input, bulb being the input in this case. So when the train comes up to it, oh, whoops, you lost power. It's like, how do you know? Be because I lost my input. Well, what happens if it's a loose wire? It doesn't matter. I lost my input. It thinks there's a train in front of it right now. Wouldn't that be bad for ghost trains? It's like, no, that's exactly what you want. You want that. You want the system to fail occupied. That way, if you lose a wire, or you lose power, you blow a fuse, anything like that, the ride thinks there's a train there and shuts the entire ride down due to safety. You want that. You don't want it to just, yeah, there's, it's probably fine. Go ahead and operate. You don't want that at all. So we want to make sure that it works that way. Also, you can take your sender and receiver and start moving them. Granted, these two are really close to each other, but at some point in time, they won't see each other anymore. So if I take that and then start moving this guy, didn't take much misalignment in that direction to turn on. I'm just moving the sensor up and down just slightly to get that. But it probably will bounce off my desk just fine. Up until right there, that's, that's almost a 45 degree angle. So, but whether alignment, shaking, everything will play a part in these photo eyes. Um, this is one of the easiest ways, however. Uh, there's essentially this assembly, but in a pre-made holder, and they're very small. They're literally like the size of my fingers here, like that. Um, this would also, two of these together in one assembly, would be called an optical fork. Forks are used on plenty of indoor dark rides where a train is passing through it. They use those for blocks um, to count and do other things because they can send the brake fin right through and it will count and use position but you don't have other things like sunlight and weather to get in the way so they're very stable indoors. So lots of rides, I know the one I would go to all the time like Space Mountain at Disneyland. They're on most rides, Disney loves using those things but they use optical forks that way the train can sit here and wander side to side like this and it doesn't matter. So you might get a proximity sensor that might not pick up that fin if it was all the way over to one side, but every time your fin goes through that optical fork, it's going to get it pretty much every single time. Downside to that, you can lose a hat. It'll fall in the sensor, shut the ride down. All right, let's play with proximity sensors now. Okay. I have saved some trouble and I have pre-wired this into this little MicroLogics controller. And the reason why I did this is because I wanted to demonstrate the normally open and normally closed. And the easiest way to do that is actually going to be able to see the inputs turn on and off right here. That's going to be the easiest way to do it. Um, so I wanted to do that. The only thing is I've got a well, I might, I might want to use that power source. I'm going to have to get a second plug to wire in from somewhere. Hmm. Hold on a second. I'll be right back. At this point in the video, if you haven't done so already, please make sure you like and subscribe. And let me know how things are going. If you like the video or not, I'm up for everything. I read all the comments that come through. And share the video if you want to. Oh. 
Okay, I've got another plug. Now my neighbor's Christmas lights don't work. It's okay, didn't like that guy anyway. I'm like, turn your lights off. He's like, no. I'm like, okay, I'll fix them for you. Whose lights don't work now? I just needed the end. Tell me if that's not okay. Nah, it'll be fine. Take all the warning stickers off. No big deal. There we go. We are powered up here. Okay. Let me see if I could turn this off. I'm gonna do this kind of a little bit darker. Make it a little easier to see. Our first sensor. This is the first sensor right here. It's this little zero light. So we're gonna flag the sensor. See it changed the one. So what we're doing here is that the sensor that's on the zero right now, that's the normally closed side of the sensor. And then when I energize or when I tell it to turn on, it goes to the number one side. Now here, if you can see this, there's an indicator light on the back. So if you ever see mechanics with their hand over it and they're out there like with their eyeball right on top of it trying to figure out what it is, that's because most of these sensors will indicate So if you could watch, you could pretty much see everything right here. So you can see this changing state. I know when it's off, the zero is on, and when it's on, the number one is on, and it's flagged. So this is the proper feedback we're looking for. So in this case, the zero would tell the ride that everything is okay in front of it, and when the one turns on, it says, oh, something blocked it. So it's counting the zero dropping out, but the one turning on is telling it that the sensor is working and not just a power loss in this case. So that's like a check. So it says, yep, there we go. My zero went away, but my one come up. That tells me that something legitimately passed in front of this proximity sensor. And it wasn't simply just the sensor lost power. So you can do that. You can watch it there. So then we can use the other sensor here. This is the same exact deal, but it's over here on this input right here. It's right here on five and six, and when we flag it, see that? I'm sorry, it's five and four. So when I flag that guy, input five turns off and four turns on. If you're wondering, what exactly it looks like to troubleshoot roller coasters and stuff that are having misbehaving problems out there. Mechanics outside watching the light turn off, off and on, on top of a sensor, and mechanics inside the control room watching the inputs change state. Like this is essentially what you're looking at when you're seeing rides run. You're seeing all sorts of stuff like this happening. Now, one thing you have to be careful of with these sensors, newer ones not so much, but if you put them too close together, I doubt I can get it to do it with these two, but if you put the sensing heads too close together, they can start cross-talking with each other, which I don't think these will do it because they're too cheap and small. No, these won't do it. Uh, so I'll give you the example that I found or I know, I know of. Um, I was talking with the, I was like the head of engineering basically that was working at Disneyland. Um, and what they found out was that on the Matterhorn, they had 
two proximity sensors they used as the as the bobsled passed over and they had the two right next to each other like really 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 close again this was really old technology at the time so most of this stuff doesn't exist it's not a problem anymore but they had it what would happen was as you would flag the the train came over and would flag the sensors and they would turn on then the train would leave and they would turn off well sometimes when the train passed back over them the sensor did not turn off it would actually stay on and it would stay on indefinitely and it would cause a ghost train so it would shut the ride down all the time so what they figured out is that these guys talk in wavelengths essentially and they produce different wavelengths for different type of sensors even by the same manufacturer so they found out that if they had two that had a certain size wave and they put them right next to each other they would cross talk and turn the sensor on so what they would do is they would write the numbers on the boxes and on the sensors and the mechanics at the time would just know or electricians at the time would know not to put certain numbers next to each other but again uh, most manufacturers of proximity sensors and all that sort of stuff it's been leaps and bounds working on this so I don't think really cross talking is much of a problem anymore unless you're using optical opticals tend to cross talk because they start getting signals from one to the other. You imagine if a, a sender, this is more like a manufacturing plant, the sender is pointing away from here going to a receiver on that side and then behind it on another line there is another assembly just like it. Well this sender could start talking with that receiver on a completely different line and they could start messing up so what they do is they modulate the frequencies on them, um, kind of. They basically tell them to talk on different frequencies so one sender can't give the signal accidentally to a different receiver. It's complicated. I honestly don't know that much about it because I've never had to deal with that myself. But these are what proximity sensors do. So we say, okay, can we use this? To turn on our light bulb why yes yes we can let's do that so now I have this sensor right here working off of input number two and then the normally open side is going to power this guy and when this guy closes, it's going to turn on the light bulb. So if we flag this here, should be able to watch everything happen. There we go. So now my input on the relay went high and it told the relay to close. So now I'm using a proximity sensor to tell this relay to close because this can't handle that light bulb. If I were to wire the light bulb up to it, A, it's the wrong voltage, but even if it was the right voltage, it pays, it has too much current going through, it would just destroy this completely. So I use the small signal from here to power a relay to allow the 110 volt, the bigger voltage, to go through the bulb. So we can sit there and do that as much as we want to. And then I also have feedback on the input side. Number two goes out. showing that it's working. So this is an example of how we would use a proximity sensor to control that. And then if you're dealing with a person who says, oh no, wait, we want that to be all the time on, and then we want that flag to be off. So there's two ways you could do it. We could swap the wheat leads and say we want to use the normally closed side on here now. Or, easiest thing to do is just go back to the relay take the main voltage down and then right now we come out on pin number seven and we want it to come out on pin number five right next door I'm, I'm sorry I, I hope this is my microphone is not skipping out like it did last time 
Uh, when you deal with solid state stuff, like in this case, I'm talking about the microphone, um, when you play with electronics around them, man, they really get messed up sometimes. I remember I had a drive inside of a Zamprilla flying carousel, a swing ride. When you keyed up your radio in that room, both the drives would turn on their uh, like kind of like a zero speed reference, and the relays would all start clicking. And you literally couldn't hold the radio conversation for too long before the ride would fall out. <laughs> Old technology, old drives. Okay. So now here we are again. You see my input 2 is still on. Everything is normal. The relay is still off in this case. But now I've wired it onto the normally closed side. So now when I flag the proximity sensor, it turns off. Pretty cool, right? Okay, so it was a much shorter video today, which I, I think that's just because I pre-planned everything and got the wiring all set up ahead of time. But, um, and you know, the last video was really the meat and potatoes of it, how to build latches and stuff like that. Peripheral sensors, there's a millions of them out there of all different shapes, sizes, sensing range, everything you could think of, they make it for there. Um, it's just configuration of how they go um, to say, okay, your rectangular proximity sensors are going to be on the track. They're the ones you're going to see. The ones that you don't see are going to be your pin proxes. Because, like, on a transfer track assembly where the pins lock into place, there would be a bore that the pin goes into. Well, you don't see it from the outside because you have to look really closely but on the inside of that bore, typically down in the corner down there, there is a proximity sensor sitting in there like that. That way when the pin goes in, the prox turns on and says, okay, my locking pin is in place now. There's a lot of barrel proximity sensors that are used for pins and to fit in really tiny hard spaces. Uh, this is a decent size, an 8mm or 10mm proximity sensor. This is a decent size prox. Um, it goes to a lot of stuff. They sell them much smaller. When I was shopping around on Amazon, I can think I get these down to like 5 or 6 millimeters or something. They were super small. But I think they go even smaller than that too. I don't have a great example on these guys. But you can see the the light right there back up before that. But if I were to use something here's a capo for a guitar, right? I should be able to sense three millimeters out, but if you watch this guy, I pretty much have to touch the head before it turns on. That's because it's actually reading a piece of stainless steel bar back there, but this is aluminum. So these typically don't like to read aluminum. They will, but the sensing distance is all messed up. Like right there, I'm pretty much touching the head. It's not like I'm on top of that. So it's much better to use something metal. And the more metal you use, the further away it can go. See when this guy turns on here. Go right to that guy. Oh yeah. About five millimeters away. I don't know if you can see that. Probably can't. But it's about five millimeters away as opposed to the aluminum was touching it. So the type of material it's sensing is also determine on how far away it needs to be. Most of the time, like aluminums and brass and stuff like that, most manufacturers tell you not even to use that because they become very unreliable. They have special sensors that will pick up aluminum and brass and things like that, but most inductive sensors won't. So the other thing I wanted to go over in the middle, in the beginning of the video, I told you that this was a 
PNP style sensor. Now, if you go shopping for these on Amazon, which some of you are probably already shopping for them, um, there's two types of sensors. There's a PNP and a NPN. Now, these are the style in which they output their signal compared to what your PLC is using. It's either a syncing or a sourcing style PLC. Um, that's the best way it I like to think of them, but there is a lot of theory behind this, and here's where the electrical guys are really going to dig into the comments and just you'll probably get some essays down there about PNP versus NPN um, because what I'm about to tell you might just blow your mind or it might piss you off, depending on <laughs> how much you know about these things already, right? So I'm going to give you the Ryan the Ryan Mechanic Redneck Backyard uh, ex explanation of PNP versus NPN. Basically, when you need an output to go into a, a logic controller like this, you either want the positive side or the negative side going to it. And for most all ride stuff, we use positive. We take positive control voltage, send it through a switch, and then send that positive voltage to meet the PLC. On the other side of the PLC is the negative. So when the positive meets the negative, the input turns on. The other way you can do it is you can use the negative and send it through the switch, and when it meets the positive on the other side of the PLC, the input turns on. I want PNP. So the way I think about it is it's Power coming in, the device works off of neutral and sends power out. Power in my mind is positive, so it's power, neutral, power. So I'm getting positive out. Good thing about it that way, power, neutral, positive out. The other way, the negative comes in and then you use positive to make the device work and then your negative continues out. By the way, everything that's, I call it neutral wiring, everything that's neutral wired or that style where it uses negative for everything, that's all your stuff like computers, monitors, everything around the house is done that way. Industrial controls are all used positive out there for everything. And there are instances where both are inverted, but well, I think I spent enough time on this video sensing things. So I'm Ryan the Ride Mechanic. Have a good day. Remember, don't play with live voltage. And as always, Stay off the areas. Bye.